Man, I'm excited to preach this message to you. Judges, a battle that refines us. It means something's going to change in our lives if we get this message straight. Something's going to shift in our world if we take a hold of this teaching and we apply it to our lives. It's not enough to just get the teaching. We've also got to apply it to our lives. Pastor Sonny did a great job last week of kicking us off. She gave us the context. She told us about the promise that Abraham had. It wasn't just a promise for him, but it was a promise for all the generations after that they would be blessed to be a blessing, that they had a promise that they would take this presence of God, take this goodness of God to all the generations. But it says in Judges 2.10, it says, but quickly after that Joshua generation, the generation right before the Judges, quickly after that Joshua generation, a generation arose that knew not God or what he had done for the Israelites. And we're so quick, we're so quick to forget. But God has something more, just like he had something more for them, he's got something more for you this morning. And so I'm so glad you're here. You truly are the faithful remnant. I mean, it was an hour time difference. I I got, I was in a shower this morning and this stroke of thunder hit and I thought, man, we're in trouble this morning for attendance, but you made it. So thank you for being here. I'll do my best to, to, to honor that with some enthusiasm, some great teaching today as I get ready to sit down here. But we see what's happening in the Israelites and we can mirror it directly to our own lives. This cycle, this exodus cycle of people being repressed, people being in despair, then they cry out to God, God sends a deliverer, delivers them, they praise him and then Pretty quickly, it says right there in Judges 2.10, immediately after that Joshua generation, a generation arose that knew not God or what he had done. Man, I don't know about you, but I forget all the time how good he's been to me. I forget all the, I mean, I don't just, I don't just leave my faith on the side, but I forget all the time the incredible miracles that just being in this seat for me means. The incredible miracles that having the family that I have means, the incredible miracles that, that God has done to get me to where I you are or what you've done. But I'll tell you this, I, I, can't, I can't look into your past or look into your future without looking into your right now. And knowing that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what's happened in your world, God got you back here in this seat. God got you back here on this website. God got you back in his presence again. And you can't take it for granted. Because it's, it's not an accident. But what we say all the time, it's not coincidence, it's providence. God isn't just doing fun things to trick you out. He's doing miracles to get you back into that Abrahamic covenant blessing that he wants you to experience. So today I want to get into the book of Judges. I want to talk about the, the, the judge Gideon, who you lot know, have known a lot about probably from previous sermons, but I'm not going to talk at all about the fleeces. I want to talk about his character and who he was, and I want to talk about faith this morning. Abraham was a man of faith. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is the great faith chapter tells about all these great men of faith, and it says, I don't even have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Jephthah. I don't have time to tell you about all these men of faith that were in the book of Judges, but today I've got a few minutes. So I want to take you down that road. But before I take you down that road, I want to do something special for us. I want to have the Bible Project take us down that road. If you've been with us any length of time, you know that we support this Bible Project uh, endeavor every single month. Part of your tithes and offerings go to support this ministry, and it is fantastic. If you read your Bible and you're not using the Bible Project, let me just encourage you for a moment. Before you begin any Bible reading, before you begin any book of the Bible, the first thing you should do is go to thebibleproject.com, see what they say, because it will give you so much insight, so much context, such a great ladder to climb as you read the text things you never would have seen otherwise, but they also have word studies. So today we're gonna to look at the Bible Project's definition of faith. So if you would do me a favor, turn your eyes to the screen and let's roll that footage and let's see what they have to say about faith. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. 
We're going to look at this last characteristic of God. It's the Hebrew word emet, which can be translated as faithfulness or even truth. It's related to another word you've probably heard before, amen, which is an untranslated Hebrew expression meaning that's truth. So, emet can mean truth, and it can refer to correct ideas or concepts. This is because emet has to do with stability and reliability, like when Moses holds up his hands for hours to defeat Israel's enemies, the Amalekites. His friends put a rock under him and support his hands so that his hands will remain emet, or steady. When a met is used of people, it describes reliable and stable character or trustworthiness. Like when Moses appoints leaders in Israel, they're to be people of a met, people who are trustworthy, who won't take bribes or distort justice. So to say that God is full of a met doesn't just mean that God tells the truth or stands for truth. It means that God is faithful and trustworthy. This is why Moses calls God a rock, saying that he's faithful, just, and upright. He's saying that he can trust God to be consistent to his character. And the Hebrew word for trust is actually the verb form of the word emet. It's he'emin. It can be translated as to believe or to have faith, but most basically it means to consider someone trustworthy or to trust. The first person we meet in the Bible who considers God to be trustworthy is Abraham. God makes a promise that Abraham and his wife Sarah will have a huge family and that through them, all nations will experience God's blessing. But Abraham and Sarah are really, really old and they've never been able to have any children. And yet in the face of these challenges, Abraham means God. He considers God trustworthy to open a way forward. And God does show Emet to Abraham and Sarah. In just four generations, their descendants form a whole nation called Israel. And God invites Israel into a trusting and faithful relationship. And when God leads them out of slavery in Egypt, Israel means in God. They trust and rely on him. But when they come to the land God promised to Abraham, and they find out it's filled with giant cities protected by giants, their trust in God's Emet fails. But eventually, we meet an Israelite who does trust God in the face of giants. It's David. He yells at the giant, You come with a sword and a spear, but I come with the name of the God of Israel. David consistently relies on God. In fact, it said that David walked in and met before God. So David considers God to be faithful and responds with faithfulness. This is why God promises to raise up a faithful descendant of David, whose kingdom will endure forever, or in Hebrew, have emet. This faithful king will become the source of trust and stability for others forever. But when the kingdom later collapses, the Israelites find themselves without a home and without a king. And they cry out, Oh God, where is your loyal love that you swore to David in your emet? They're accusing God of abandoning his promises to Abraham and to David. Is God trustworthy? Is he faithful after all? The first line of the New Testament is an answer to that question. This is the lineage of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In other words, through Jesus, God fulfills his promises. Or as Paul says, Jesus came on behalf of God's faithfulness. He is the faithful king whose kingdom will endure forever and who invites all nations to trust God. Now, trusting anyone is risky. It's hard to know if anyone is really full of emet. But the biblical story portrays a God who's been faithful all along and whose promises were fulfilled in the story of Jesus. And so as we look out at the obstacles facing us and our world, we're invited to take that same risk and join Abraham, David, and the people of God in trusting that God is overflowing with faithfulness. All right, fantastic. So what we're learning there is that God is faithful, and we're made in the image of God. We're meant to be representations of faith as we live out our lives. A couple weeks ago, I did this example, and they asked me to do it again. And so I want to give you this classic Christian example of what faith looks like, because we can be raised in church and think that faith means if we trust and, 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 and wish with integrity, then what we want will be ours. That's not exactly 
really at all what faith means. But if we take this chair here and we pretend like this chair is a representation of the divine and we look and we go, okay, I, I feel like this chair is, is stable. I know what it's for. I know it's for resting from my standing. I see it's got good legs. I can, I can kick it. I can, I can see it's, it's, uh, it's padded so I can feel like I know it's going to be comfortable. I've seen people sit in this exact chair so I know it works. I understand that if you sit in it, it will hold you. All of those things are great, but they're not faith. All of those things are ideas and principles about the chair. But faith comes... Faith comes when I take all my understanding about the chair, all my understanding about God, about the divine, and I take my whole life and I rely on it for what it's meant to deliver. I take my whole life and I rely on what I know about this chair to do exactly what it's meant to do to give me rest. If I don't trust in the chair, I'll sit like this and I'll never get the rest. But if I believe that the chair is good for what it's meant for, I can let my arms rest and my legs rest, and I can find, I can find the fruit, the very rest the chair is meant to deliver. So if I take that back to the divine again, I go, okay, God says I can rest in him. I can have faith in him. He is good for blessing. He is good for rest. But if I just say I believe, and I wait to take everything back again, or I think, well, he's good, but he's not good for this. I believe that he's good for some people, but not for me. He's good for some troubles, but not my troubles. Then I miss the mark, and I, I lack the faith. And so then I lack the testimony. I lack the fruit to say, yes, he is good to do what he promises. So even as Sonny convinces us of a convinces us that the promise is for us last week, we now have to take possession of that. So let's look at the story of Gideon and see what happens in Gideon's life because that mirrors the same idea. Let's start in Judges chapter 6, verse 11. I'm going to read verses 11 through 18 along with you on the screen. Judges 6, 11 through 18 starts here. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at Ophrah and belonged that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord's with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of, the, of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, now if I'm found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. And then we get into all the fleece stories. But listen to what's happening with Gideon. Because I think it, it mirrors our own image when difficult times come. And we'll see in a minute exactly what Gideon was facing. And it's no small thing. Don't think this is like, oh, a job insecurity. Don't think, oh, this is, this is relationship strife. Don't think, oh, this is, this is just a little financial difficulty. My bank account isn't lining up. No, this is complete oppression. It says the Midianites, when they would find any fruit, any product, any wealth in the land, they would destroy it. That's why Gideon's inside of a wine press doing something the wine press wasn't meant to do. He's threshing out his wheat. Because if the Midianites find any of it, they will either take it or burn it. They're not allowing the Israelites to have anything. And they are massively powerful. I don't think there's one person in this room who's experienced the kind of oppression that Gideon is facing. And yet his message can stand true in our world for whatever we're facing this very week. Pardon me, Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? 
You ever said that before? Has that ever been your prayer? Pardon me, Lord. Uh, but if you're with me and all this preaching and all these songs that I sing are true, if you're with me, Lord, why has all this happened to us? Now listen, we need to really read our Bibles well because he says, pardon me, Lord, lowercase l. He's saying, pardon me, master. Pardon me, Lord, like you're just one of many gods. Pardon me, you who come to me. But if the Lord, capital L, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one true God that he had heard about but didn't quite believe in, if that God is with us, if, that, if you are who you say you are, because I'm really not sure that you are, if that were true, then why would my situation look like this? And if you've never met anyone who thinks like that, then you've never met anyone at all. And if you don't think that you felt like that, then you're probably a little deceiving yourself because we all get in that situation. But the crazy thing about this, the crazy thing is that Gideon is going, where is God? If, if, if Yahweh was with us, we wouldn't be in this situation. Yahweh has abandoned us. But the crazy thing is, we've read over and over and over again, Yahweh never abandoned them at all. What happened? They abandoned Yahweh. They turn to other gods over and over and over again, and it's God who is faithful. It's God who comes back again. It's God who gives grace upon grace upon grace. It's God. It's God who brings me back in this chair every week, even though every week I fall short of his best for me. It's God who gets you back in this church in a community of believers who are, who are designed, who are created, whose whole mission is to help you experience a fullness of life that can only come from him. It's our whole mission statement. It's why we build the building. It's why we have the lights. It's why we bought all this sound system. It's why we teach our kids every week. And God got you here. God, why have you abandoned us? Yet God doesn't say, there's scripture after scripture after scripture leading up to this in Gideon, God doesn't say, hey, listen up. He just graces him. God just comes again in patient, loving, loyal kindness. What did that scripture in the Bible Project say? I think it was Exodus 34, 6. I think I have it for you on the screen. Did I put that on my slide? Real guys, that first slide in the mix. Exodus 34, 6, and he pa the Lord passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That God of Exodus is that God in Gideon. He's faithful, and he's coming back again and again and again. He says, but listen, but, but pardon me, Lord, but... But, but why are you coming to me? Because I'm in the least in my tribe, and my tribe is the least in Israel. Why are you coming to me? You see, Gideon was trying to serve any God he could find. In fact, his father had made the altar to Baal. His father had designed the Asherah poles that he would go and cut down. His family was involved in idol worship, and he didn't understand who God was. So he goes, well, even if you're, if you're with us, why are we in this situation? Well, you don't understand. It's actually you that's walked away. But, it, but why would you call me? I'm the least of the least of the least. Well, haven't you read, don't you know anything about the way I work? Don't you understand how this whole relationship, didn't you read about Moses? Don't you understand about Joshua? Don't you know about your people? That I didn't choose them because they were prosperous. I, I, I chose them even though they were the least. I didn't choose them because they were the strongest. I chose them either though they were slaves in Egypt. I didn't choose them because it's never been about you it's always been about me being able to bless you exactly the way that I said that I could. So when Gideon says, but, but me, Lord, what about me? I'm the smallest. I'm the weakest. And make no mistake, he's trying to get out of it. Make no mistake, it's a terrifying call. But he also feels completely unequipped to accomplish. And let's not have a raise your hand moment. Because I think if the, the truth is if any of us had any idea the enormity of the call, the enormity of the task that God has before each and every one of us, our confession would be the same. Lord, how can I do what you've asked me to do? 
Maybe that's just being kind to your workmates this week. Lord, how can you ask me to be kind to those people who treat me so badly? Lord, how can you call me to give 10% of my income? Lord, Lord, how can you call me to bring another woman with me? How can you call me to invite someone? You know I'm an introvert. I'm never going to be able to bring another woman with me to every woman this week. He says, it's never been about you. It's never been about what you can do. It's always been about what I can do in you because that's when testimony shows up. That's when the story of her life doesn't become about how good you are. It becomes about how good God is. And that's when that blessing becomes attractive for other people. That's when that idea comes out of your life and goes into theirs. He says, give me a sign as if there's six judges in the book of Judges. He's the only one who gets a theophany, a, a visible manifestation of God. He's the only one who God appears to. And he's like, um, Lord, pardon me. Could you give me a sign? As if appearing wasn't enough. <laughs> but we know how it works. Do you remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? And Lazarus is, is begging at the gate and the rich man dies and he, he goes into hell, and he says, please, Abraham, Father Abraham, send people to my family so that they don't have to experience this. Send them. If, if, if someone raises from the dead and goes and sees them, surely they will believe. And he says, if they wouldn't believe the prophets, if they wouldn't believe those I've already sent, even if someone rises from the dead, which of course is an allusion to Jesus, even if someone rises from the dead, they will not believe. Gideon has a manifestation of the divine in his midst. And he has the gall to say, hey, God, God could, you, um, could you give me a sign that it's really you? And what does God do? I don't know what you've done in your life, but I don't think it was this ignorant. I don't think it was this difficult. So if you're worried about whether God has plans and purposes for you, if you worry about being worthy of what he's called you to do, if you think he's given up on you for one moment, just know that God appeared in person to Gideon and Gideon said, hey, could you give me a sign to go along with that? And we know how it works. He doesn't just ask for one, he asks for two. He keeps on going, and yet God is faithful to continue to rely on Gideon. Why? Because God's got a vision beyond Gideon. God's worried about the people. What God wants to do in you isn't about you ultimately. Ultimately, it's about everyone in your influence. Ultimately, God wants to bless you. Listen, God wants to bless you because you are a deliverer. Jesus is no longer here. Now you are full of the Holy Spirit and able to do everything he has called you to do. You are the hope of the world. Mobilize with this church. Mobilize with a community who will help you to believe that you are exactly who God says that you are. You are not how you feel. Don't let your feelings drive your life. You will wreck your life. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. It is not about feelings. It is about God's truth in your world. Listen, I had this moment when I was about seven or eight years old. My parents were divorced, and, and my dad was looking to spend some time with us, and I was in second grade, and so my dad, he had this big white car. I think it was a Cadillac or a giant Chevy, and in my head, it had a red interior. I meant to ask him before I preached this message, but I forgot to, and my dad, one Saturday, drove around, and he picked up a bunch of our friends, me and my brother. My brother's two years older than I am, so we're relatively the same age. Drove around and picked up a couple of our friends, so we had about eight kids, and we all went to the the park and we got a football and we played football. My dad was all-time quarterback. And I was young for my age and my brother had some more friends than I did and so most of the kids were bigger than me and faster than me and stronger than me. At that age, two years makes a massive difference. When you're 48, two years doesn't mean anything. But when you're six, when you're eight, it's like a whole nother different world. So we're playing football and I'm just, I'm just getting killed. Like I'm not, I'm, not get, I'm not winning at all. And my dad says, okay, this time it's your turn to have the ball. I said, I don't, I don't want the ball. I'm not interested in the ball. I don't, he said, just trust me. It's your turn. And I'm, I'm sure I was crying, you know. <laughs> and it's four on four. He's all-time quarterback. He says, trust me. You're going to get the ball. And so my dad says, hike. And he gets the ball. And he hands me the ball. And I start to run. And my dad, who's, you know, 6'2", 250 pounds, my dad says, you're going to run down the right sideline. So I'm running down the right sideline. Everyone's coming at me. And before they get to me, my dad goes, boom. Boom, boom, 
boom, boom, and I get all the way down, and I score a touchdown. Now, how much of that touchdown was, was me? <laughs> but how much of the celebration was me? Every single bit. If I trust my Father to come through in my circumstance, I'll find that redemption comes. We've got to become a people who trust in our Father like we trust in this chair. Not just knowing that he's good, but relying on his goodness. Gideon saying, I'll never be able to do this. God never called him to do anything. God just said, if you'll run down the sideline, I'll take them all out. And all Gideon had to do was sit in the chair and obey. But it's much easier said, isn't it? It's much easier said than it is done. But God is so gracious. Let's look at this story again. God is so gracious that he not only gives Gideon one fleece, he not only gives Gideon two fleeces, he not only gives Gideon a theophany, and a, a, a visible manifestation of himself in front of Gideon, he also gives Gideon, by his grace, unasked for, unrequested, yet another sign. Here we go. Judges 7 9 through 15 says this. Now Gideon has gathered some warriors. He gathered a bunch. God said, that's too many, because he wants a testimony. That's too many. Let's narrow it down. They narrow it down. They got 300 warriors. Gideon's about to go in the battle, and here's what we see. Judges 7, starting in verse 8, says, Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. Who's going to do it? He's going to do it. If you are afraid to attack, of course he is. Who wouldn't be? Go down to the camp with your servant, Pura, and listen to what they're saying. If you're afraid to attack, I'm going to do one more thing. If you're afraid to attack, I'm going to do one more thing. So go down. If you're afraid to attack, I'm going to stand with you again. And oh, by the way, you can phone a friend. You can take Pura with you. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura and his servant went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amicalites, and all the other eastern peoples that settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sands on the seashore. I can't hardly say that, but I also can't imagine. You've got 300 warriors. They get to the edge of the valley. You ever been to a valley like that where all of a sudden it opens up in front of you? To the edge of the valley, and it says they could no more count the camels, in other words, count the warriors in the enemy's camp, than you could count sands on the seashore. It's full. And they've just got 300. No wonder he said, Gideon, if you are afraid, who wouldn't be afraid? Before I read the rest of this, let me just tell you this. No matter what God is calling you to do, it will always go beyond your own ability because God wants to build that testimony in your world. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, <laughs> This can mean nothing other than, and I'd love to read about what this loaf of bread really meant, but I don't understand this. He says, this can mean nothing. It can mean lots of things to me. I don't understand what bread visions are, but it can mean lots of other things. But he says, this can mean nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He didn't bow down and worship when he got a vision of God. He didn't bow down and worship for the first fleece. He didn't bow down and worship for the second fleece. None of the words of God caused him to bow down and worship, but the words of the Midianite. Only God works like that. The testimony of the Midianite caused Gideon to bow down and worship. And you can say, man, isn't that coincidence he had that dream? Come on. Isn't that coincidence that just when I needed some encouragement, isn't that coincidence that when I faced opposition, he brought someone into my... It's not coincidence. It's absolutely providence. Let's go back to that scripture again. He bowed down in worship. He returned to the camp of the Israelite, the camp of Israel, and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. 
So what's happening here? God's giving grace upon grace upon grace. And he says, I am going to. And it causes Gideon to worship. Won't he do it? It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. What does that mean? Once we discover, not up here, but once we discover the tangible goodness of God manifest in our lives, it will lead us to turn our lives completely around. It's not like his kindness is a pleasant way of saying it's time to turn. His kindness is so overwhelming. His kindness is just so good. Gideon's dad is the idol maker. Gideon doesn't know anything about Yahweh. To start it off blaming God for his circumstance. Well, if God, if you really are who you say you are, I wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. And yet God, sign after sign after sign, faithfulness after faithfulness after faithfulness, manifests himself in this last moment before the attack. And he says, just go down. I know I've already given you three signs, but just go down because I still want to encourage you because I know it's going to be hard. But I told you, I'm with you. Now let me show you how I'm working in the places you never imagined possible. Let me show you how I'm working behind the scenes where you would never have seen it if I didn't show you. Don't just imagine that God is moving in what you can see. We've got to believe with all assurance that God is absolutely working in what we cannot yet see. Faith is the assurance of what we cannot yet see. God is delivering this army into the hands of Gideon, and how much more is he going to deliver good things into the hand of of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Judges 8, 33. They destroy the, the Midianites. They don't have to lay one hand in battle. They do this ruse with these, with these lamps and these vases, and they just kill each other. The Midianites kill each other. Not one man is lost in the battle. And it says in Judges 8, 33, no sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bareth as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of their enemies on every side. No sooner did they forget what God had done. It's just the way it works. It's what we're going to see over and over and over again as we explore scripture and it's what we're going to experience in our lives over and over and over again. But what God is telling us is that if we understand his character, if we understand his very nature, then what we will discover in his faithfulness is that even though we continue to turn away, he will welcome us back again. Even though we continue to turn away, he's still waiting to bring deliverance back into our lives. Even though we never would deserve it, he's always willing to bring it back again. They did not remember the Lord who had rescued them. We just repeat and repeat and repeat the pattern. How do we get out of this? How do we get out of this? How do we get out of this cycle that says we, 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 we know who God is, we show up on Sunday, yet by Monday morning we've just forgotten all of his faithfulness. We've forgotten all of his goodness. What says they forget? They fail to remember. So what do we do? We remember and we remember and we remember and we remember, we teach you songs to sing on your car, on the way to work, on your drive home from church. We give you a community with connect groups so that in the middle of your week, when things get a little muddy and the vision of who God is and his faithfulness gets a little bit, a little bit unclear here, you can go with Caleb and Sunday to the tennis court and you can get a little encouragement back again. You can go to Jen Rakowicki's Connect and you can get a little encouragement back again. You can go to Boss and Kim's house with LaVar and Salithia and get a little encouragement back again. You can find a connect group. Maybe those people don't fit for you, but there's so many across this church. If that one doesn't work, just go to another one. We give you those opportunities so you will not forget because the human nature, we are no different than all of these Old Testament characters. Our human nature is to turn away again. 
The people needed a king, and they had not found yet the king because God was always meant to be the king. Your king is not your likes. Your king is not your follows. Your king is not on Instagram. Your king is Jesus. And we've got to make sure. But what happens? What do we do? I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not condemning anyone. We're all the same. We, we think that in Sunday mornings we go, yes, Jesus is king. King Jesus, he is Lord of our lives. And then we allow Instagram to take hours and hours of reels of our time and pull us away. Maybe that's not it for you, but maybe you allow your stomach to pull you away. You go, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna get into my Bible, I'm gonna get into my Bible, but as soon as I go get some lunch. I don't know what your Lord is. I don't know who it is that has the most authority in your life. But I wanna, I wanna encourage you. We need to remember And the best way to remember is to surround ourselves. When anxiety becomes, let anxiety be the flag that points you back to prayer. When loneliness comes, let your loneliness be the stake that puts you into a connect group finally for that first time. When Instagram pulls you away from the goodness of God, use that phone for what it was meant for and call one of your friends and say, hey, can we just grab a coffee? I could use some encouragement. God didn't call us to live individual lives. You can't read scripture and find that truth. God called us to do this together because he knew we would need one another to go and do all the things that he's called us to do and to experience, like our mission statement says, experience full life in Jesus. Psalm 136, we've talked about that a few times this week. Let me end with this. Psalm 136 says this. It's it's the psalmist, and he's just like you and me. He's living a difficult life. He's having disappointments. He's having letdowns. He's having difficult Sunday afternoons. And he says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. You can read this like it's all encouragement, or you can read this like he's, he's driving the memory into his heart. He's remembering every time, give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Skip to the end. He says... In Psalm 136, starting in verse 23, he says, he remembered us in our low estate. He remembered we had no capacity on our own. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives, us, he gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. The way we remember is to remember is to constantly put it before our eyes. And when we do that, our testimony will be like that of our fathers who said, God is good, his love endures forever. I find it difficult to trust God who seems so distant sometimes unless I remember all the good things he's done, including my dad on that football field that have got me into this place, including the encouragements of faith. He showed up over and over and over again, but but that story about my dad is one of the closest reminders I have to how good he is. He appeared to Gideon, he gave him the fleeces, but when the Midianite confessed the dream, Gideon bowed down and worshiped. You never know what God's gonna do. Keep your eyes out. Because no matter what you think about yourself, no matter how you feel about yourself, the battles of this week will refine you back into the image of God. The battles of your life will polish you up like a beautiful copper penny, taking away all of the tarnish, all of the insecurity, all of the uncertainty. It will pull it back, pull it back, and pull it back. And in the end, when you understand the character and nature of God, because you've read books like this, you've sung songs like this, you've hung out with people like this, You will find those difficult moments and you'll settle in to a reliance on who he is and his kindness, all the good things he's already done for you, all the good things you know he wants for you today, and all the good things you're believing for for your future. You'll rely on those things and you will find rest for your souls. It's available for you right here 
right now, today. He was good to Gideon. He'll be good to you and to a thousand generations to pour out his unfailing love and kindness to those who obey him. That's Deuteronomy 7, 9. A thousand generations. It begins with you today. Come on, let's close our eyes. Let's ask him to do exactly that. Father, I thank you so much for all you've already done to get us in this place. God, I thank you that you brought Princess into this church so we could worship today. God, I thank you that you brought Glenn Dunahue in this church so that we could purchase all this great equipment. God, I thank you that you brought Maggie into this church that we could teach these kids. God, I thank you for so many people. God, I thank you that you brought me into this church. Thank you that you brought us in this church that we could experience your love and your goodness and your faithfulness. Today, Father, help us to rely on those things that we might experience your promises your plans, and your purposes for our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.